today on Legalese. We are talking about two outrageous examples of bad cops skirting responsibility through qualified immunity. This includes a unique case where qualified immunity was granted to an officer whose victim was actually another officer. And another is a truly shocking example of a man who did absolutely nothing wrong but found himself being followed home and assaulted by a true sociopath who was later found to be an off-duty cop. Hey, greetings, everybody, and welcome back once again to Legalese. Now, as always, I am your host, Bob, and I want to thank you all so much for joining me here today. If you happen to be new to my channel, let me especially welcome you. Uh, This is the podcast where we're going to be discussing all things constitutional law, as well as current events in other areas of law, politics, and culture. Now, I just want to remind you guys real quick that to find out more about the show, you can head on over to our homepage at LegalEasePodcast.com. There you can get updates. Uh, You can contact me, find links, find an archive of past episodes, uh, buy my book, uh, all kinds of cool stuff you can do over there, LegalEasePodcast.com. And if you want to stay up to date whenever I put out any new content, because I put out content across the web, Uh, I don't just do videos like this on YouTube. I also do uh, an audio-only version on Spotify. Uh, I also post articles and other various things over on Substack. Uh, For example, I recently appeared on the Freedom Hub podcast last week to talk about my book, Constitutional Sleight of Hand, uh, and about the topic of the Implied Powers Doctrine. So if you head on over to LegallyShow.com, that will take you to my Substack newsletter, and there you can not only find uh, all of my stuff that's posted there, but also if you sign up for the newsletter, you can get notification sent right to you anytime I post any new content anywhere uh, across the internet. All right, so uh, to begin today, um, I, I want to... Uh, Go back a little bit. I I, want to talk about something uh, that I used to do on this show. Uh, When I first started putting out content some years back, uh, I used to do videos uh, where I would discuss what I called blue-on-blue violence. This was a term that I had coined to describe an event where one police officer would hurt or kill another police officer, and it would be a discussion of the sometimes tragic, sometimes infuriating, but always fascinating circumstances that would result from this phenomenon. And furthermore, it looked at what happens when two people who both believe themselves to be above the law come into conflict. And any time a cop finds himself in a situation where they are expected to respect and obey the very laws that they enforce against others, it tends not to go very well. Uh, Just look at what happens when you have a cop-on-cop traffic stop. Inside the city or out here? Just right here. Okay. Uh, Go pull the video at Valero. You get on my traffic stop again, I will arrest you. Yeah, I'll arrest you. Do it, buddy. And we're going to do it. Charges do it. Do it. Do it. Do it, O. Go it. Go for it. Do it. There's cameras at Valero and there's cameras at Napa that see you pulled out. Shut your mouth. You don't talk to me like that. I'm not your boy. Talk to you, boy. You a boy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Pull over. You gonna pull over? Please say a command. Pull over. What? Do you I am going into work, my man. Why are you trying to pull me over as I'm going Because you're work? going 80 and a 45. I am going into work. Okay, where are you going to work What does it look for? like I'm dressed for? I have What no does it look like I'm dressed for? My name is Deputy Hilton and they see your driver's license. No. Okay. 3113, copy at 1050. 10 for I got a city uh, Orlando PD taking off from a traffic stop. Now, in my past videos on Blue on Blue Violence, these circumstances were very different to the example we're going to be talking about here today. That's because in past videos, we talked about uh, another 
legal doctrine that is every bit as unjust and ethically repugnant as qualified immunity is, and I am speaking about the felony murder rule. Now, the felony murder rule is a legal doctrine in some common law jurisdictions that broadens the crime of murder. Now, when someone is killed in the commission of a dangerous or enumerated crime, the offender and also the offender's accomplices or co-conspirators may be found guilty of murder. The concept of felony murder originates in the rule of transferred intent. Thus, when a person participates in an inherently dangerous crime, he or she may be held responsible for the fatal consequences of that crime, even if someone else actually caused the death. And the felony murder rule acts as an exception to the normal rules of homicide. Normally, a defendant can be convicted of murder only if a prosecutor shows that the defendant acted with the intent to kill for murder or with a reckless indifference to human life for manslaughter. Now, under the felony murder rule, what happens is a defendant can be convicted of murder even if the defendant did not act with intent or with reckless indifference. And the prosecution here only has to show that the defendant participated in a felony where a fatality occurred. Now, while there are rare circumstances where the felony murder rule is at least ostensibly a reasonable and potentially appropriate doctrine to be applied, the real problem is when it is utilized to the benefit of police officers and to the detriment of their often entirely innocent citizens who wind up being punished for a crime they didn't commit. And the application here of the felony murder rule never comes close to meeting the sort of highly scrutinized circumstances that would actually potentially warrant its use. And that's before we even factor in the clear conflict of interest in all of this by allowing the actual perpetrator to blame someone else while assuming a position of authority that automatically makes his allegation more credible than his innocent victim's denial in the eyes of the criminal justice system. And perhaps the quintessential example of what I'm talking about is one that I covered here on an old episode of Blue on Blue Violence. Now, this was a case that came out of Bonneville County, Idaho, and while responding to a call in which a motorist, a woman named Jenna Holm, had been in a single car crash on a rural stretch of road, Bonneville County Sheriff's Deputy Wyatt Mazur would die after his colleague, Sergeant Randy Flegel, accidentally hit him with his police cruiser. Now, Major would die at the scene. However, Jenna Holm was charged with manslaughter. Now, it is uncontested that Holm did not kill Mazur. In fact, when the accident happened, she was laid out on the ground completely immobile, having just been tased repeatedly. Now, if you're perhaps wondering what felony she committed, which, if you'll remember, is what a lawful enforcement of felony murder requires, the commission of a felony in which a fatality occurred, well, there was none. And what we find, instead, is an internal police investigation that found the officers had failed to follow standard safety protocol in securing the scene on the road that evening. And they concluded that Major had neglected to activate his rear emergency lights and that he had stepped out in front of a moving vehicle. Furthermore, another deputy on the scene had given wrong directions to Sergeant Randy Flegel, and this other officer also left off his emergency lights, and none of them were using flashlights as needed. Now, it gets even worse because the state actually sought to withhold those findings from Holmes' defense in direct contravention of the Brady Rule, which of course establishes that you must make exculpatory evidence available to the defense in a criminal case. But what happens when the result 
is not death, but instead a grievous bodily injury. Well, in a recent case from Kentucky, a hapless cop who shot and paralyzed a fellow cop ended up being granted qualified immunity. Now, defenders of qualified immunity often argue that it's needed to protect law enforcement officers, but in this case, it would protect one officer while simultaneously screwing another. And the main thrust of this case can be found in the headline of the article that actually initially turned me on to this whole incident. And that reads, Kentucky Supreme Court case shows that qualified immunity can even keep police from getting justice. And I couldn't have said it better myself. And the facts of this case come from this particular article, as well as the court records of the several lawsuits filed as a result of this particular incident. Uh, and as always, those can always be found on the show notes page for this episode. So back in 2018, then Scott County Police Deputy Jamie Morales was partially paralyzed after he was shot in the back by then-Georgetown Police Officer Joseph Enrico during a standoff with a fugitive at a rest stop of I-75. Now, after sustaining this life-changing injury, Morales would sue Enrico, as well as the Georgetown Police Department in the city of Georgetown, arguing that the officers there did not have adequate training. Now, unfortunately, Morales has run into the same legal hurdle that everyday Americans always run into when their rights are violated or they are in some other way harmed by a government official. The courts have essentially told Morales that Enrico cannot be held accountable for paralyzing him, and now Morales' hopes for getting justice rest in the hands of the Kentucky State Supreme Court, who have just agreed to hear this case. Now. Qualified immunity shields government officials from liability so long as the right that they violated is not clearly established. Now, while this may not sound like a crazy standard, what it means in practice is that even if the court entirely agrees that the cop being sued is at fault, or that the cop's action clearly violate a constitutionally protected individual right, that's not enough to bring a civil action. Because what you need is to be able to point to some past case precedent whose facts are sufficiently identical to the facts at play in your own lawsuit in which the court would find that the police did in fact violate that person's rights and they found qualified immunity did not apply. And it is only then that your lawsuit against a police officer can go forward. And this, of course, can and does lead to absurd conclusions. For example, a recent case I discussed here on the channel was Bailey v. Isles, in which police officers would send in a SWAT team to arrest a man under a state anti-terrorism law because he posted a joke about COVID-19 on his Facebook page. Now, this man brought suit against the police officers and department involved in this clear violation of both his First and Fourth Amendment rights, yet the trial court would dismiss the case, despite finding, actually, that this was, in their own eyes, an obvious violation of his rights. But because he could not pinpoint a clearly established analogous case that identified these same actions as a violation of another plaintiff's rights, that wasn't good enough. And so the Morales case shows that even police officers and other government officials can become the victim of bad actions of government officials, yet find themselves with no means for holding those officials accountable. And this is precisely what qualified immunity does. It creates a legal labyrinth that is impossible to navigate for any victim, whether it's a police officer, uh, an ordinary citizen, or really anybody. Now, frankly, I can't help but wonder if a case like this, which is an obvious injustice to the injured officer, isn't perhaps a benefit 
to those of us who want to see an end to qualified immunity. Because the sad fact is, no matter where you go, no matter where you find yourself in the world, the stupidest people are always the cops. And perhaps the only thing that will get them to understand just how unjust this doctrine is, is for them to become the victims of their own standards and practices. And we have to ask if qualified immunity blocks both everyday innocent citizens and innocent police officers from getting justice, then who is this doctrine even really protecting? Well, in the vast majority of qualified immunity cases, there is a clear pattern that will emerge of the protection going to inferior men compelled to obtain qualified immunity, superior legal protection, and who see this as a way to compensate for the former by abusing the latter. And this is exactly what happened in our second case, Rosales v. Bradshaw. So here, Chavez County Sheriff's Deputy and world-class douchebag David Bradshaw was granted qualified immunity following a fit of road rage whose circumstances were so bizarre as to truly beggar belief. And it is for uh, that reason that I want to stress that the following account has been pulled directly from the original case files of the criminal and civil suits, which I, of course, encourage people to read, uh, and in cases like this, if for no other reason than to verify that my synopsis is accurate and present it in context. And as always, all case briefs, documents, and other resources are available on the show notes page, and proper citations are included in the episode transcription. And so, according to the official court records, here's what happened. So, on March 18, 2018, Mario Rosales was driving home in his hometown of Roswell, New Mexico. He passed a black Ford pickup truck driven by off-duty Chavez County Sheriff's Deputy David Bradshaw. Now, Bradshaw apparently didn't like being passed by Mario in his yellow Mustang which set off this off-duty cop explosive temper. He started following Mario and called another deputy to look up information uh, about him and his car, essentially trying to dig up dirt on this guy who did nothing. Now, we will be coming back to Deputy Bradshaw's exact account of events in his own words a little later, but for now, I want to stress a couple very crucial points uh, that should be kept in mind throughout the telling of these events, uh, and we will get into the details of these later when we go through Bradshaw's account. So first of all, Bradshaw was not on duty at the time of this incident. He was also traveling in his own personal pickup truck. He was not in uniform. Rosales had no way to know that the guy who had become to harass, begun to harass him was a police officer, and Deputy Bradshaw never at any point alleged that Rosales had actually broken any law, ordinance, infraction, or moving violation, and he doesn't even allege that he operated his vehicle in an unsafe or reckless manner. Now. The following incident solely occurred because Bradshaw was, in his own words, greatly offended that another car passed him, despite the fact that Rosales passed him in a safe and wholly legal manner. Now, meanwhile, worried that the hostile stranger behind him was actually following him, Mario Rosales started taking a less direct route home, making turns without signaling to see if he was indeed being followed, and sure enough, the black truck would track him at every turn. And seconds after Mario pulled into his driveway, Bradshaw would block him in with his truck, uh, and understandably very scared that some road-raging stranger had now trapped him, Mario put his lawfully owned handgun 
in his pocket and displaying it openly in accordance with New Mexico law. And Bradshaw immediately began yelling at cursing at Mario without actually explaining who he was or why he had followed this man home. Now, Rosal is trying to calm him down, but Bradshaw continued to yell. At one point, Bradshaw made a comment about Mario's handgun, at which point he simply explained that he was exercising his right. Now, it was only at this point that Bradshaw would identify himself as a police officer and seemingly really only brought it up to lend credibility to a threat that he had just made that he should issue Rosales a ticket, despite the fact that throughout the encounter, as I said, he never even actually explained what Rosales had done to warrant this treatment. And as we came to find out, that's because Rosales had not done anything that might possibly justify this assault against his person. But somewhat cryptically, Bradshaw told Rosales that he had already contacted another officer. And it was at this point that Deputy Bradshaw pulled out a revolver and pointed it at Mario, who kept his hands away from his gun and tried to reason with Bradshaw. Now, when a gust of wind momentarily blew Mario Rosales' shirt over his handgun, Deputy Bradshaw would remark, quote, now that's concealed carry, end quote, which is a, a threat because in uh, New Mexico, you may open carry a gun, but not concealed carry. And so with this, Bradshaw would take the revolver he had out and raise it like he was going to shoot Mario. At this point, Mario put his hands in the air and he backed away. And as he backed away for the first time, Rosales noticed that uh, Bradshaw's toddler was in the front passenger seat of his truck and that the child was between the men and just inches away from Bradshaw's gun. And at this point, Bradshaw offered to lower his gun and talk with Rosales. If only he would put his gun back in his car. So Rosales did that. Bradshaw then got out of his truck uh, wearing a long sleeve t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. But instead of talking as promised, he kept his gun aimed at Rosales and asked Mario for his license and asked him if he had been drinking. Mario gave him his license and said that he does not drink. Bradshaw would continue to berate Mario in the driveway. Now, this went on until another de deputy arrived on scene who fortunately would convince Bradshaw to leave. And Bradshaw would leave, but not before telling Mario, quote, I'll talk to you in court when you get your citation in the mail, end quote. And after this incident, a state prosecutor would charge Bradshaw with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and child abuse. Furthermore, a jury found Bradshaw guilty and a judge imposed a two-year sentence. Now, Bradshaw's employer, Chavez County, dismissed him from his job uh, and has argued that what Bradshaw did was outside the bounds of his employment. Now, Bradshaw has always refused to admit that what he did was wrong, and Chavez County has refused to take responsibility for hiring this fucking psychopath, for failing to train him, and for failing to fire this officer with a volatile temper who would have to be forced out of other law enforcement jobs in the past for similar reasons before getting his job with Chavez County. Now, he also had a history of other incidents while employed by Chavez County in which his violent temper and his inclination to abuse his authority as a police officer were leveraged against others to settle the score for personal grudges. And so for these reasons, Mario sued. And in federal court, the judge would decide that Bradshaw did indeed violate Mario's constitutional rights, finding that it was unreasonable to hold Mario at gunpoint when he had posed no threat. But the court would dismiss Mario's case by deciding that his claim against the county was flawed and that Bradshaw had qualified immunity. 
And this brings us to really sort of the second most consequential problem with qualified immunity. And that is the disconnect between what the judiciary in this country claim is the purpose of this doctrine and reality, really. So here is how the District Court of New Mexico, who would uphold Bradshaw's motion to dismiss uh, on the grounds of qualified immunity, would define the purpose of granting qualified immunity. They say that public officers and employees are afforded protection from damages and liability for good faith judgment calls made in a legally uncertain environment. And so, in other words, officers are not liable for bad guesses in gray areas. Thus, qualified immunity protects all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. And the court would go on to say that assuming the allegations were true, Mr. Bradshaw was entitled to qualified immunity. And even if one would agree that the above criteria would justify giving government employees special rights like qualified immunity, I fail to see how Bradshaw could have possibly met any of those conditions, much less all of them. Now, in briefs filed by Bradshaw in his criminal case, in a brief he filed as the respondent to Rosales' civil action, this is precisely how Bradshaw described his initial act that led to this hostile pursuit. And here I want to stress that the following list of statements are direct quotes in his own words from briefs filed by the, with the court by former officer David Bradshaw. And exact citations for each statement can be found on the show notes page for this episode so you can go and read them in context of the full statement and verify that I have not been cherry picking out of context quotes to make this man look like a deranged sociopath. He managed to do that all by himself and needed no help from me. So he says that Rosales was driving behind a black Ford pickup truck that was being driven by himself, Bradshaw. Bradshaw owned the black Ford pickup truck. After driving past 19th Street, Rosales overtook and passed Bradshaw. Bradshaw then took, quote, great offense, end quote, when Rosales passed him. And it was at this point that Bradshaw then began to follow Rosales. So David Bradshaw's own claim is that he was personally offended that someone driving on the same road as him had the temerity to pass him. Now you have adults going, I was offended, I was offended, and I have rights. <laughs> well, so what? Be offended. Nothing happens. <laughs> You're an adult. Grow up. Deal with it. I was offended. I don't care. Nothing happens when you're offended. There's nothing. I, I went to the comedy show and, and the comedian said something about the Lord and, and I was offended. And when I woke up in the morning, I had leprosy. <laughs> so how is something as routine as one car passing another on the road constitute a good faith judgment call or a legal uncertainty? There is nothing uncertain about one driver's ability to pass another driver on the road. Furthermore, if qualified immunity protects everything except the plainly incompetent or knowing violations of the law, how does that apply to Bradshaw, when his actions were so plainly illegal that he was convicted of several criminal offenses and spent two years in jail for those crimes? Now, there could just not be a clearer disconnect between what a judge's say the purpose of qualified immunity is and what the true purpose of the doctrine is in practice, in which it is clearly to make the protection of our constitutionally enumerated natural and individual rights mere unenforceable guarantees, what uh, James Madison would have called parchment barriers. Now, 
it's not just the purpose of this doctrine that judges can't seem to understand. They also seem to completely fail to grasp the source of the doctrine as well. Now, this is evident in a circuit court opinion uh, from our first case, Morales v. City of Georgetown, and they would identify the applicable precedent in the 2014 case of Marston v. Thomason. They said that the circuit court ruled that the officer defendants in the case were entitled to qualified immunity because, as a society, we have decided that law enforcement officers deserve special protection. But the fact is, qualified immunity was never established by any kind of democratic consensus among the people of the several states. It comes from eight dicks in black robes who fabricated this doctrine out of nowhere in 1982. And this is why the next episode of Legalese will be a long promise and uh, possibly maybe even long awaited uh, history of qualified immunity. Now, while the doctrine itself is only several decades old, you need to understand a vast amount of English common law and American constitutional law, uh, not because you need to understand where this doctrine comes from as much as you need to understand everything it doesn't come from to appreciate just how shallow the legal justification for it actually is. And so, as I said, that will be our next episode. That will be coming out in a couple of days. I have it all written. Just got to shoot it. So uh, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Or better yet, don't forget to go maybe just sign up for the Legalese newsletter over at LegalEaseShow.com to make sure you don't miss out. And that is all I have for you guys here today. Thank you so much for joining me on Legalese. Now, if you would take a moment and do all of those things that help to trigger Al Gore's rhythm, uh, you know, hit the like button if you liked it, hit the dislike if you disliked, uh, subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment, let me know what you thought. I do always uh, genuinely love to read your guys' comments and to try and interact with you in the comment section as much as possible. And also, if you would uh, please, and this is something I haven't been asking, but I should have, if you would take a moment uh, and think of a person or two you know who would appreciate uh, this show or even just this particular episode and share the show with them uh, and help me to grow the channel that way. If you would, I would be very grateful for your help. Uh, and so all that's left to do is to sign out. This has been Bob for Legalese, talking about qualified immunity. And of course, as always, Cartago de Lenda Est. Like